Hello and welcome to this tutorial on Ethernet. Ethernet has become the king of the local area network. It has been most widely adopted around the world. So you will encounter this uh, for quite some time in many networks. So a good understanding of Ethernet is important. We'll be starting with two specifications, 10 base 2 and 10 base 5. These were the original specifications created. And by looking at these, we're going to fortify our background knowledge of Ethernet. And some of the concepts we'll cover are still relevant in the more recent implementations of Ethernet. Perhaps you've heard of 10 base T, 100 base T, fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet. Those are the more recent ones, and they're still relevant. The concepts we'll cover in these more recent concepts, uh, implementations of Ethernet. So we'll start with a brief history of Ethernet, and then we'll move into how Ethernet operates, how these two specifications operate, and that's where we'll get into some good concepts. And then we'll touch briefly at the end on CSMA with CD. We'll take a look at what that is and how it fits into the overall picture. So let's get started with the history lesson. Xerox originally created Ethernet. They were looking for a way to enable computers to speak with each other, to communicate. Eventually, they partnered with other companies, Intel, Digital Equipment Corporation, DEC. They, as a group, then furthered Ethernet uh, together. Eventually, though, the group handed this technology over to the I3E, Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers. You're going to come across that acronym quite a bit. This was back in the early 1980s. And so the I3E took Ethernet and further developed it and then produced the specifications we'll be talking about. On a side note, if you've been paying attention to the OSI model, the TCP IP model, and you should take a look at the tutorials we have on those. They're very important for your CCNA and CCENT certifications, as well as your overall understanding of networking. Ethernet falls into layer one and layer two of the OSI model. 802.3, which is the media access control, that's more physical standards. And 802.2, which is known as the logical link control, those are functions in a subpart of the data link layer, layer two of the OSI model. So just as a point of reference, that's where Ethernet lives on the OSI model. So that is the history lesson, a brief history lesson. Now let's go ahead and take a look at how 802, sorry, how 10 base 2 and 10 base 5 operate. Okay, we're going to use this diagram to figure out how these specifications work. We're going to look at a 10 base 2 network. 10 base 2 and 10 base 5 are relatively similar. They differed in terms of the cabling used. Both use coaxial cable. However, 10 base 2 used a thinner type of it, often referred to as thin net. 10 base 5 used a thicker one, often referred to as thick net. Pretty straightforward. The second difference between cabling of these two specifications was the maximum distance of any given segment. 10 base 2 was limited to 185 meters, 10 base 5 was limited to 500 meters. So we'll be looking at a 10 base 2 network. We can get all the same concepts and good material out of it as we would look at a 10 base 5. The differences are irrelevant for our conversation. Some disappointing news, potentially. These are two obsolete specifications. You will not find anybody building new Ethernet networks these days using 10 base 2 or 10 base 5. We've moved on. We have 10 base T, 10, 100 base T, 1000 base T, gigabit Ethernet. So keep in mind, these are old. You won't see these in production. If you do, you've just stumbled across a very old network. So let's take a look at some of the components involved in this 802, sorry, this 10 base 2 network. Okay, let's look at the components for this network. Now, there really aren't too many of them. We start off by creating an Ethernet segment. So between here and here is our primary Ethernet segment. It's this thicker line in the diagram. And every PC, and really every device connected to this network, has to connect to this primary segment. What we're doing here is we're creating a shared electrical circuit. All the devices will use this to communicate with each other. This is often referred to as a bus, and that bus concept is going to stick with us as we explore all the different types of Ethernet. So keep it in mind, and we're going to see in a minute exactly how that works. 
Another component on this network, aside from the primary segment and the PCs connected, are two devices, one at each end, and those are called resistors. Resistors were used to absorb the signals. If a signal reached the end of an Ethernet segment, it would reflect back, it would bounce back on the segment. That would unfortunately interrupt all the other signals on the segment. It would create noise. That reflection would actually interrupt the rest of the network. So you would need to have each end properly terminated with a resistor. What you're not going to see on this network are some devices you might be familiar with already, like Ethernet hubs, Ethernet switches, and even wiring panels. Simply stated, the Ethernet segment using the coax cable, the bus, was all there was to this network. You could, however, see one device, and that's called an Ethernet repeater. We're not going to jump into it here. We have a separate tutorial uh, examining the ins and outs of Ethernet repeaters, so take a look at that if you're interested. But other than that, this is pretty much the entire realm, the, all of the components for our 10Base2 network. So we have the components down. Let's take a look at how this network operates. All right. Let's say PC1, which is right here, wants to communicate with PC2. What will happen is PC1 will create an Ethernet frame and send it out. That frame is going to hit the bus, the shared medium, and it's going to go in both directions. And PC2 will get a copy. It will receive that frame. And so will this other PC. We'll call that PC3. Until the signal is sent to, uh, reaches the end and is terminated by the resistor. So when PC1 sent the frame to PC2, every device connected to the bus receives that frame. So if the bus is like a public bus and it, it makes a stop at every bus stop, everyone's home, well, our bus here, our 10 base 2 Ethernet segment bus, stops at every connected device and delivers the frame. So PC2 receives the frame. That's great. PC3 does as well. Not a big deal. PC3 is going to simply ignore it because it realizes that frame is not destined to it. So likewise, if PC2 wants to respond, it will source an Ethernet frame. It'll hit the bus and then it'll start going in both directions. And PC1 will receive the frame, and so will PC3. Again, PC3 ignoring, discarding the frame, because it's not addressed to PC3. So that's the bus concept. Everybody gets a, everybody receives the frame, the public bus makes the rounds, everybody gets it. It's almost like if you're on a if you're in a crowded room or a crowded subway car or even a crowded bus and everyone, somebody yells, everyone receives, everyone hears it, everyone receives the message, similar to that. Well, that's fine and dandy, but what happens if PC1 and PC3 both want to send something to PC2? So let's take a look, and that's going to bring us to our next concept of CSMA with CD. So let's take a look at what happens here. PC1, PC3, and PC2. So PC1 sources a frame and hits the bus and starts to distribute along the bus. At the same time, PC3 sources a frame to PC2 and it reaches the bus and starts to get distributed. And what happens is the two frames are going to collide. That's a collision. And unfortunately, when the frames collide, it renders both of them unintelligible and they're discarded. No one can make use of them. So the frames, they will not reach PC2 or if they do, they're useless. They cannot be used by PC2. And that's a big problem with this type of network design, this uh, specification of Ethernet. So, not too surprisingly, a 
a means of getting around this problem was also created. And that was called CSMA with CD. That stands for Carrier Sense Multiple Access with Collision Detection. As I mentioned earlier, we have a more in-depth tutorial on CSMA with CD separately from this, but the basics are, are pretty straightforward and we'll cover them here. Essentially what CSMA does is it tells each PC to wait. And it waits until the bus is quiet. It's going to wait and see if there's no traffic on it, no other frames being sourced. And it'll do that before it sends a frame. So wait until it's quiet, and if it's quiet, go ahead and send a frame. Now, if every PC does this, we lower the chances of collisions to happen, because PC3, for instance, in our example, would have waited for PC1, because it maybe PC1 sourced the frame just before PC3 was about to. However, that said, collisions can still happen, and, and PCs can still source frames at the same time. So, with CSMA, with collision detection, Collision detection means if a collision is detected, wait for a random period of time and then try again. So that's going to increase the chances that two PCs do not go ahead and source frames again and create more collisions and essentially render the, the network useless. So CSMA is a way to go about dealing with collisions on the shared bus. It doesn't prevent them, it just gives us a means to look out for them, and if they do happen, to address them. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at some of the concepts we covered today. So to summarize, we looked at 10 base 2 and 10 base 5, and we looked at some of the differences between the two in terms of cabling, and we realized that both of these specifications are now obsolete. We won't find them in the real world, at least in new implementations. However, some of the concepts are still relevant. Specifically, we saw how an Ethernet segment is created using coaxial, and all devices connect to that. And we create a shared electrical circuit by doing so. And that shared electrical circuit is commonly referred to as the bus, and the bus delivers all frames to everyone connected to it. And that's how communication happens on 10 base 2 and 10 base 5 Ethernet networks. The downside is sometimes devices can source frames at the same time. They meet on the bus, they collide, and that collision renders them useless. So the information that's received is of no value to the destination, and it has to happen again. One way to address this problem is using carrier sense multiple access with collision detection. And that essentially means a device will wait until the medium is quiet, there's no traffic on the bus. If that's the case, it'll source a frame. Now, a frame collision could still occur, and if it does, devices are made aware of it, and before resending, they wait for a random amount of time before trying again, and that's to lessen the chances of a collision happening again. And there you have it. Those are all of the main points we wanted to cover in today's tutorial. Thanks for watching.